voice of new life starts now. Good morning and welcome to New Life Baptist Church. Just like that, my favorite part of the church walks out. Uh, whether or not you realize it, we are grossly outnumbered by children this morning, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing because they are the future of the church. Doesn't it feel like summer outside? 80 degree weather, the sun is shining, there's no thought of any snow on the forecast. Um, 80s yesterday, 80s today, 80s forecasted for tomorrow. It's a reminder that we live in Iowa because next weekend it's forecasted to be 50 degrees. So we're going to go back to more of what we would consider to be spring-like temperatures. But hopefully as the days change and the weather changes daily, uh, we don't lose sight of what is coming. Hopefully you've had a good week. You're ready to study the Word of God together. If this is the first time you've been with us, either in person or online, we welcome you. We are New Life Baptist Church. We started in a home, in my home, uh, around with minimal things, minimal Bibles, no hymnals, and God has seen fit to continue to bless and to grow us, and uh, we've seen people come to know Christ. We've had two baptismal services. We look forward to having another one here as the weather warms up, and we're able to do that. But our desire is not that you necessarily be a part of our church. Our desire is that you find new life in Christ. And our desire is that you grow in your walk with him. The Bible is very clear that even if you know Jesus Christ, it doesn't end there. It's not that we're saved and we know where we're going to go when we die. There's a life that we're called to live now before the unsaved world. And we want to help you grow in that walk with the Lord. We want you to be discipled and maybe nobody's ever come alongside of you and helped you to understand how do I take the truth of what's in God's word and make it fit with daily life. And we want to do that and we'd love to have that privilege. And this morning as we open the word of God together, we trust that you are encouraged from it. Take your Bible with me if you would this morning. Turn to the New Testament letter of Ephesians. Ephesians. If you haven't been with us, At all, if you haven't been with us recently, we are in our sermon series entitled Redemptive Relationships, Experiencing Our Relationships in Light of the Gospel. And we're in Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Very familiar passage of scripture, verses 1 through 4. You probably have these memorized. Not because necessarily you memorize them in Awana or some other kids uh, program. You probably memorize them because if you have Christian parents, your parents drilled these verses into your head. And that's why when somebody says Ephesians 6, the first word comes to mind, children, right? And you can just start and you can go for those first four verses at least because you've memorized those. Our series on redemptive relationships, looking at all of the relationships in our lives in light of the gospel. Aside from yourself this morning, the only thing that you will take into eternity are the people around you. It's a very humbling reality. All the things that we put our time and our effort and our energy into, our jobs, our houses, your hobbies, whatever those may be, cars, the outdoors, all of those things are not going with you. Heaven will be far better than any of those. But the only thing that you can take with you are the people that are around you. And we don't make a point to invest in those people. A redemptive relationship is one that has eternity in view. We spent the last couple weeks looking at husbands and wives and wives and husbands and that relationship there. Are you keeping each other focused on eternity? However, you may be far through this life. Eternity is forever. We celebrated my oldest boy Ben's birthday this past week with a family and I was looking back through the cakes that I make for our kids, and that's just kind of a tradition that's carried over. And I was reminded, Miriam's not little anymore. And I look back, and it's like, the reality is next January she'll be 11. Where does the time go? And even in our lives, we think about it, you may feel young, you may be in your 30s, you may be in your 50s, but the reality of it is, someday when life is over and eternity starts, it's forever. What are you doing to prepare for the forever because the now is short? James says our lives are but vapor. We ought to be working on growing in our own life and our walk with the Lord, but also seeing to it that the people around us know the Lord. 
Our sermon series has highlighted different relationships. We started with the vertical relationship we have with God. All of us, whether we know him or not, all of us have been given the chance to know the God of the universe personally because of his son, Jesus Christ. And because of what he did on the cross, and because of that, the Bible says that when you trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and he indwells you. He's the one that helps you know who the people are around you that need the Lord because you see them. He convicts you. Go talk to that person. He takes the scripture and uses it to convict you as well. We spend a great deal of time looking at the relationship we have with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We moved on. We talked about the relationship we have with the Word of God. We looked at the relationship that we have with the church. We talked about the relationship that we have with the pastor. The last two weeks, we've looked at the relationship that you have with your spouse. And this morning, I want to go to Ephesians chapter 6 and look at verses 1 through 4. So follow along, either on the PowerPoint or in your Bible this morning. Ephesians 6 verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. We're going back to the family this morning, and specifically the relationship you have with your children. Now I realize this morning that everybody here may not necessarily have children, but the reality is everyone here has parents. Even if they're not biologically connected to you, you're adopted. And you have parents somewhere. You came into this world somewhere at some point in time because of your parents, which makes you a child. And you think about this this morning. How is your relationship, parents, with your children? As I was getting ready for today, I couldn't help but think about the relationship that I have as a child of God. Because how I am as God's child greatly affects the way that I as a father parent my children. How are we helping them focus on God and on eternity? I want to be clear this morning as I get started that God loves children. And that children are a gift from God. That was really quiet. Even for a church... God loves children, and children are a gift from God. If, if you need to go back to, you can read the story. In the midst of Jesus preaching and teaching, he stops everything that's going on. Even the disciples are saying, get these kids out of here. And Jesus says, bring them here. And the Bible is very clear. He made a point to interact with those children. Why? Because he loved them. God loves children. Children are a gift from him. Listen to what Psalm 127 and verses 3 through 5 says. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. You have on your outline this morning some blanks. I want to give those to you. You already got a couple of them. Every believer must understand that God loves children. Children are a gift from him. But more important, children are a long-term investment for discipleship and eternity. They're a long-term investment for discipleship and eternity. We live in a world and we live in a time where children are, and this is the reality of the world that we live in. It's sad. Children are aborted. Children are abandoned. Children are abused. Children are ultimately seen as a hindrance to my adult life and career. I don't think any of us this morning would disagree with the world's mindset toward children. Kids and teens that are in this service, you have wonderful parents that you've been blessed with by God. You need to realize that. Children and teens, it it might feel like at times that you don't have the best parents, but remember that you're not necessarily the best kid either because you're a sinner. And the goal of Our walk with the Lord is for us to become like Jesus Christ, but we struggle with sin at times. And your parents, no matter how and who they are, God works with them too. They have sin struggles.
The way that you think about your parent's child or teenager is how you will come to think about God because He is your Father. God gave you whoever your earthly father is to direct you to your heavenly father. And many times you don't see that as a child and the older that you get, you grow in your fondness, your appreciation for your parents. God is the ultimate authority. He's the one that put the authority in your life called your parents. And you learn to obey them and consequently you learn how to obey God. A young single preacher took the first part-time church of his ministry as he was going to college. He preached a message one Sunday entitled, Ten Facts on How to Raise Perfect Children. A few years later, he got married and they had their first child. He pulled the old sermon out to preach it again and this time decided that he needed to retitle it. So he changed the message to, Ten Suggestions on How to Raise Healthy, Godly Children. After the second child was born a couple years later, it was time to preach through that same topic again. This time he changed the title to 10 Possibilities for Parenting Godly Children. The third child came. This time he revisited the whole thing and called it 10 Prayers for Godly Parents Regarding Their Kids. Several years later, when they became teenagers, he burned the message and wrote a new one simply titled, Help Me Jesus. And if you have children, you understand that There's a lot involved in that. My guess is that some of you feel exhausted this morning with the demands of being a parent and trying to keep up with everyone and everything in life. Some of you may be thinking this morning to yourself, Amen, Pastor. There's kids everywhere. There's diapers that need changed. There's dirty feet. There's mountains of laundry. There's rebellious teenagers. I have so much to do and I need help. And let's be honest, there's probably very many this morning that feel overwhelmed with raising children, and it's not funny because it's a lot of work. By no stretch of the imagination is parenting an easy job to do. While parenting, it's one of the biggest blessings that God gives, it's also one of the biggest responsibilities, and at times it's frustrating. Why don't they just get it? That's what you say, and your parents said it way more times than you ever did the first year you were alive. But the reality of it is, when you brought that newborn baby home from the hospital, they didn't give you an instruction manual. All five of our kids are different. They have different likes. They have dislikes. Some of them are easier to obey. Some of them, you say it a hundred times, and they still don't obey until you really put some pressure on them. But God's word gives very specific instructions on how to raise your children the right way. Not my way, not your way, it's God's way. And the reality of it is, is that how you choose to raise your children is how you choose to raise your children. I can't force you to do that. But God's word can help us in raising our children so that we make sure that what needs to be done happens We're looking at a very familiar passage this morning. And we love to pull this out when our kids mess up every time. I can't tell you the number of times I have written verses 1 through 4 out on a whiteboard or a chalkboard because let's just say I wasn't being very obedient as a child. I memorized scripture, maybe not for the right reason, but I memorized it. And we have to be careful, mom and dads, that when you start to joke and you kind of elbow your kids with this, you know, you need to obey, we, ha- we have to be reminded that what Paul writes in Ephesians is for all of us. If you want your children to submit and to obey you, it's kind of an elbow back to you. You need to submit and you need to obey God. And all of a sudden, that feeling of obedience kind of goes away uh, and you don't feel too confident because we understand a lot of times we're not obedient with God. And we struggle with this. All the Christians were called to be filled with the Spirit. They were called to live in light of that. They were to submit to one another. And we're going to look this morning at your relationship with your children. But before we do that, let's stop and ask the Lord's blessing on our time in prayer. Father, quiet our hearts before you. Father, be with the message that you've laid upon my heart. Give me clarity of thought this morning to say no more and no less than I need to say. That your word would be what we remember. That the Spirit would have freedom to work in our hearts and lives. That as we think about the subject of children and parents, and eternity, that you would help us to see your word for what it says. Hide me behind the cross. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Maybe you've heard this story about the three young husbands who were in the hospital waiting room, three friends that were waiting for their wives to give birth. Miraculously, all of their wives got pregnant around the same time and they wound up in the hospital relatively at the same time. They were all sitting there waiting in the, the uh, waiting room and the nurse came in and said to the first father, congratulations, your wife just gave birth to twins. The father jumped for joy and says, that, that's an incredible coincidence. He said, because I work for the Minnesota Twins. I mean, the odds of that, having two kids and working for the Twins, this will be great. A few minutes later, the nurse came in and told the second father, congratulations, your wife successfully gave birth to triplets. Triplets? He jumped for joy and said, that, that's incredible. There, there's got to be something going on here. This is bizarre. Because I work for 3M. Third father heard this. He stood up and shouted, oh no, and proceeded to faint and fall to the floor. The nurse tended to him, and when he came back and was revived, she asked, what, what's wrong? Why did, you, why did you pass out? Why did you faint? To which the only thing he got out before he fainted again was, I work for 7-Up. <laughs> now, you think about it. Children are a treasure from the Lord, whether you have one, whether you have a dozen, or 16. Whatever number God has chosen to bless you with is a gift. But it's also a responsibility. It's an awesome responsibility. Sometimes when we're busy cleaning up after a sick kid or we're changing a dirty diaper or we're folding that same outfit for the one millionth time, we don't think about it being awesome. But it is. They are not a short-term loan. It's not, I have these kids for 18 years and they're gone. They're a long-term investment for your family, for your church, for the world that you live in. The place where discipleship starts is the home. Discipleship starts in the home. God intended for it to start in the home. I want to ask this morning, though, what do you ultimately want for your children? All parents have ideals. They have things that they want for their children. We'd be a fool to think that we don't. I have no aspirations for my children, said no parent ever. We have aspirations for them. But however you choose to answer that question greatly influences how you raise them and what you push them toward or away from. Let me give you some examples this morning. Common answers from parents. I want my children to be happy. Well, last time I checked, the way to make your children happy is... No rules and boundaries. Just get rid of them. And I would warn you this morning, there's a potential problem with that. I want my children to have all the stuff I didn't have. There were things you didn't have as a kid that you can now afford to give your kids. Maybe they should or shouldn't have it. But if you spoil your children and you always get them what they want, there's a potential problem that develops from that. Maybe you say this, I want my children to have all the opportunities I didn't have. And so you become a taxi service. You go from music lessons to sports practice to every other extracurricular activity. There's a huge problem there. You say, I want my children to be successful. And so we push them in school. We push them to get grades. And we put these unrealistic expectations on our children. And some of them, the child may or may not be able to attain. And when they can't attain it, what happens? There's a big potential problem there. The reason why we do these things is because in our hearts, we all want the same thing for our children. We all want what's best for them and their future. We're constantly asking, what's best for my children? What would be the best thing? And if, But maybe that's the wrong question to ask. If you know Jesus Christ and you claim to be his follower, we should be asking what is best for God. After all, isn't he the one that changes their life and ours? So the reality is if he's in charge of your home and he's in charge of your children, what's best for God will always be best for your children. I'll emphasize that again. What's best for God will always be best for your kids because God is the one that gave you the children and instituted the home and we miss this. 
What is best for God is for parents to raise up a godly generation of children and young people who are passionate about Him and His kingdom. But unfortunately, you don't see that in the world today. You don't see people who are raising their kids to know the Lord, to love the Lord, to serve the Lord, to be excited about His kingdom. Even Christian parents, they trade the reality of all of eternity for the temporalness of today or tomorrow's activities. If you really want to live in light of what's best for God, it changes your goals and your priorities. Your home becomes a training ground for you to train your children to follow Christ. You've been given the responsibility as parents to to raise and encourage your children to have a relationship with Christ. That should be the one thing that you pray and you plead with God for. God, help my kids to have a relationship with Jesus Christ when they can understand. That's the ultimate goal. You want them to know Jesus Christ, right? So what are you doing to help them get to that point? But then from there, how are they growing in that? I think the Bible gives us a wonderful model for parenting. And it's interesting in the passage, Paul did not tell the parents to admonish their children. In fact, he does it himself. We don't like it when somebody else admonishes our own kids. I don't know why. It's biblical. Paul admonishes these kids, and he literally says, Paul does, as this is read out loud in the assembly, which is how this letter would have been written and read, it literally would have come across all of a sudden in the midst of the children in the back seat like maybe some kids in church. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Paul's letter is read and it's children obey. And those two kids in the back seat that have been ignoring all of what Paul said, all of a sudden their ears perk up and they're listening and they're going, oh, this is for us. Paul wrote something for us. I want to read this in a little bit different translation. It says this, Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you, that may you, you enjoy your long life on earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In getting ready to preach this morning, I came across a quote, and I'm not sure who wrote it, but I want to read it for you. It says, A child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in his father or mother. So if they don't see God in you and in your life, the odds of them finding God and finding a relationship with Christ in you and through you are, are greatly diminished. I want to get into this. Three God-given responsibilities for parents regarding children and eternity. Number one, you're to train your children to obey. What's the opposite of obedience? We talk about this at our house quite a bit. What is the opposite of obedience? Disobedience, right? Kind of weird how that works. Look at the text of Scripture. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. There's two things here. You have both these on your outline. You are to teach them to obey as their parents. I'm going to give you both of these before we get into this. You're to teach them that they are to obey as the they're to obey you as the parents. You're, You're their parents. They're your children. They are to obey you. But there's a clarifier, there's a little prepositional phrase, and it says, in the Lord. So all of the kids that originally heard this, when they were listening, Paul has been writing this letter, and it's being read out loud in church, and they're talking about submission, and all of a sudden these kids hear, children, obey your parents. And they do what most kids do. Well, my parents are this, 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 and this. And all of a sudden they hear this little prepositional phrase come out, in the Lord. And all of a sudden, these children that know Jesus Christ are going, oh, I get it. I'm to obey my parents like I would be if my parents were the Lord. I get it. I want to dwell on what God said about how to have a better relationship with your child this morning. Not what any man or woman might have to say, but what God says. The word obey here is the word hupo, akuo, Hupo meaning by and akuo meaning to hear. So literally it means to listen attentively. The picture here is of a porter waiting, ready for an answer when there's a knock on the door. I don't know about you, but my children are not like that. They're not like a porter waiting to obey. But that's what, that's what they're to be. 
They're to be ready to obey at the moment when there's a need to do that. The moment that you speak and you ask them to do something, there's obedience. And teaching obedience to your kids is not an easy task. So how do you teach it? Slowly, consistently, repetitively, over and over and over and over and over until they get it. And you pray and hope that they do. It's not a small task, and there's three reasons why. There's corruption on the outside that teaches them, go ahead, disobey your parents. There's the internal curse of sin inside of them that is constantly a reflection of not anyone except you. Because if you look at your children, the odds of them are, you're going to find at least one if you have multiple that is like mom or like dad, and they have the same stubborn qualities and traits and the things that make you, 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 (laughs) they're in them. And you see that. And their own childishness also doesn't help in teaching them to obey. But verse 1, God commands children, those who are under the parent's care, whether a toddler or a teenager, to obey. There's an order in nature ordained by God that argues the righteousness in this action. We've all heard the phrase, who came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Well, let's ask the question, who came first, the parents or the children? Real simple answer, the parents did. Therefore, in God's ordained plan, the parents are the authority. The parents brought the child into the world. Wouldn't it be great if you could choose your parents? Who would you choose? Do you want an athlete for parents? Would you want some rich, famous person? You know, it's amazing to me that God knows who you need for parents before you're ever born. And that it's not just enough that you have a dad. It's that you have a mom too. And that your mom and your dad perfectly accent each other well in raising you to be who you are. God gave you your parents to teach you to obey. And really, when you're teaching children to obey, you're teaching them about authority in life. Authority is a basic part of life, whether it be home, whether it be school, whether it be your work, whether it be in society. Authority is there. You can't get away from it. God is our authority. And as you're teaching your children to obey you, you're teaching them to obey God. And they learn to respect authority. And if you're having trouble with this, let's look at verse 1 again. Children, obey your parents the Lord, for this is right. Who is it right by? Who is it right for? Who who is it that's pleased with this? And the answer is, it's the Lord. They're to obey the parents in the Lord. We learn to obey His authority when we submit to God's instructions about our lives, children as parents, employers, each other, as I detailed last Sunday morning. We learn to submit. You're to teach your children to obey. Number two, you're to train your children to honor. Verses two and three, we don't think about this a lot from this perspective. And I want to take this passage, be it in New Testament times, I want you to go all the way back to the book of Exodus for just a moment. The children of Israel are given the commands from God, the Ten Commandments. We know them very well. We're good at breaking them. The Ten Commandments that were given... And we say today, what do the Ten Commandments have to do with me? I'm a New Testament believer. That's Old Testament. We don't, we don't do any of that stuff. And the answer is, well, <laughs> you need to reread your Bible. Because of all of the Ten Commandments, there's only one that is not repeated in the New Testament. You know what it is? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's it. All other nine are in there. Jesus dealt with those. And one of those that's mentioned again is this one. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth. So, in honoring your parents, you're honoring God first. Sometimes we look at this and we just immediately jump to, I need to honor my parents, okay? I get that. But really, you need to honor God first. Because God is the one that asks you to honor your parents. You honor God first and your parents second. Look at the verse. The mention of honoring parents, as I said, it goes all the way back to the fifth of the Ten Commandments given. 
And Paul applies it to New Testament believers. As I said, it doesn't mean that we're under the law because Jesus Christ died to set us free, but rather it's a reminder that it's practical for New Testament living. And it was just as wrong for a New Testament Christian to dishonor his parents as it was an Old Testament Jew. The word honor here comes from the Greek word tamao, which means to value or set at a high price. Do you value your parents? Do you see a high value in them? The root word means to pay. Honoring your parents goes beyond doing what they say in obedience. It's not only the outward behavior, but it's the inward attitude that you have. Honoring means that you hold your parents in high regard. The day when your children move out of the home and are no longer under your authority, God expects them to respect you all the days of your life. Let me stop and ask this question. Parents, do you still respect your parents if they're alive? Respect never goes away. We all know the song, right? R-E-S-P-E-C-T. We, we learn that, right? But do we live it? We can agree to disagree with our parents. There's nothing wrong with that. The question is, do we respect them for who they are and who God gave them to us to be? There are parents. That'll never change. But do we respect them? Do we honor them? Children hold their parents in high regard involving two attitudes. One is respect, the second is trust. They go through four stages, right? They idolize their parents. They can do anything, and and their child just is amazed with them. They demonize them, meaning I begin to blame mom and dad for my problems, my struggles, my troubles, whatever it may be. Then they get to a point where they get a little older and they begin to utilize them. And that's usually around the time they turn driving age. Dad, can I borrow the keys? Dad, can I have some money? Dad, can I? And they begin to utilize you. And then there comes a point in time, usually in the life of children, where they begin to humanize their parents because they see their faults, they see their failures, they see their struggles, and they're reminded, mom and dad aren't perfect. I won't ask this morning how many of you you'd say, yeah, I've seen my mom and dad and I've seen their shortcomings. My question is, do you still honor and do you still respect them for who they are? You realize that if every one of us were like that before God, none of us would even know him? Because honestly, we don't honor our Father, our Heavenly Father, the way that we should. We don't respect him. Many children say, well, my father, my mother, they, were, they did this to me and, and, and I can never forgive them. I, I didn't ask if you forgive them. I asked, can you honor and respect them? Obedience flows from respect. To honor your parents means that you respect. Obedience flows from trust. Parents are entrusted with protecting their kids from making bad mistakes. Honor your father and mother. You should honor them. You should respect them because for the first however many years of your life, they kept you from running out into the street after whatever you threw out there. They kept you from making horrible decisions that maybe could have cost you your life. Do you (laughs) respect that? And you say today, even when they give you their advice, when they give you your opinion, it doesn't mean that you have to wholeheartedly agree with it. But do you respect it enough to listen to it in its entirety? before you cut them off. When you have a family of your own, you can honor parents. There are times that youth have to choose. Even in unsaved homes, do I have to obey my parents or should I be obeying Christ because they're pulling me the opposite direction? The Bible is very clear. We are to honor God first. But I want to really camp on the third one of these this morning. That is this. Parents, you're training your children to follow. You're training your children to follow. The Bible is very clear in verse number four. And fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. I hope you can get those two blanks on your outline. Training and admonition. The parenting idea, it involves two different things. And helping them follow God. We want them to follow God, right? But there's, there's two parts to that. 
The first one is kids, it kind of makes us squirm, and that's discipline. The second part of that is discipleship. The Bible is very clear that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He chastens every son that he loves. Why? Because his goal is not for him to grow up and be a rebellious son or daughter. His goal is that through the chasing of that child, they would be brought back to where they need to be with him. That's the purpose with our children. That's why we discipline in our house. We discipline not because we seek to take anger out on our children. That's not right. We seek to discipline them, to correct them, to bring them back like God does with us. You know, it doesn't do any good to just discipline them and leave it there. You have to teach them, and teaching will always be part of discipling. You have to disciple them. It's interesting how God uses this. Your home is the greatest discipleship ministry you can ever be involved in. You know what? You don't reach anybody else in your neighborhood, in your community for Christ. It's not a problem, but you need to reach your home. Because God expects for you to disciple your children. We don't like the discipline thing. Parenting is difficult to do. Do you remember the first time you ever corrected your child? And they sat there and they said, maybe, Mommy, I I didn't mean to. Daddy, I didn't, whatever. And you say, I know, but I have to correct you because of it. And it, it almost, it crushes you on the inside as you correct that child, because you see that brokenness, they know they did something wrong. But discipline is a good thing, and it's essential if you're going to raise godly children. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will drive it far from him. That's Proverbs twenty-two fifteen. Hebrews twelve ten says, Our fathers disciplined us for a little while while they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It's a challenge. How do you guide your child in truth as you discipline and correct? It's interesting that when Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, parenting was somewhat different than it is today. In Greece, parents were at liberty to abandon a child, to cold, to hunger, to beasts, all with no threat of punishment. So they could literally take their child out and they could throw the child on the street and never talk to the child, have anything to do with that child again if they did not want to. All of a sudden, you feel very glad for your parents, right? This was in that particular time period. A father had life and death power over his entire household. He could cast you out. He could sell you. He could kill you. At birth, a father determined the child's fate. If he didn't want you, you weren't there anymore. If a father picked the child up, it would mean that the child could stay in the home. The father walked away, the child was disposed of. The discarded healthy infants were usually raised by slaves or prostitutes in the time of Paul. And in spite of that culture, Paul instructs the fathers. He says this, fathers do not exasperate your children. It's a principle that applies to both men and women. The word exasperate means not to provoke or to anger. Anger is usually the result of broken expectations. You ever gotten exasperated with somebody? The Bible is very clear. Don't let that be your children. Why are your children exasperated? Well, maybe there's some reason. Maybe they don't understand the rules or the expectations that you have. Maybe your rules aren't very consistent One child can do this, another child can do that, and the the child is going, well, how come they can and I can't? Maybe your rules aren't demonstrated. You ever apologize to a child when you're wrong? That'll humble you. Children have never been good at listening to their elders, but they've never failed to imitate them. Are your rules surrounded with affirmation and praise? A youngster brought home a report card heavy with poor grades. His mother asked, What do you have to say about your report card? The boy paused for a long few moments, hoping to get some reassurance from his mother and replied, Well, Mom, 
one thing is for sure, you know I'm not cheating. You think about it, even sometimes the words that we use with our children when we discipline need to be done in love. But there's a second side of it. There's discipleship. The Bible is very clear. It says training and admonition of the Lord. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. I need to correct something that's been misstated by many from pulpits all across America. God does not promise that in the Bible, if you train your children to know God and you read Scripture to them and whatever, that when they get older, they're not going to walk away from God. There's a misconception about that. If I just do this and this and this and this and I follow step A, B, C, D for their life and they grow up, they'll never leave God. And can I tell you something? Anybody can leave God at any moment. But you know why they usually leave? There's more than one reason, but a lot of times it's because we forget our children have a free will. And along with that, that free will always goes back to the training that they did or did not receive when they were a child. Train up a child in the way he should go. I have friends of mine that are pastor's kids. They grew up in pastor's homes. Surely they could never walk away from the Lord, right? Wrong. Did they get training? Yes. But they also have a free will. God does not promise in the Bible that your children will always stay with him if you just do this. The principle is that if you train them up in a way where they come to know the Lord, they should want to follow him. It's interesting that it's the responsibility as a parent that you are to teach them, you are to show them by example what the way they should go looks like. What does your way that you go look like? From the very beginning, God designed the home to be the place where children learned about the Lord and His Word. It's interesting. You can go back to the Old Testament and look at this. However, we as Christian parents have, have done our kids a disservice Many Christians' parents have left the responsibility to the pastor. We'll let pastor train our children how to walk in the way for God. Oh boy, that's a problem because I only see your kids maybe once, maybe twice a week. How about our Sunday school teacher? Surely they, they can teach our child to know and to walk in the way that they should. Well, that's great. But that Sunday school teacher more than likely will change as your child gets older and so it's not the same one. Well, what about Bible school? And I could, I could fill in Christian person after Christian person after Christian person. And the reality of it is, it's your job, parents, to train your children and give them the admonition of the Lord. It's your job. Not somebody else. You say, well, what about the church? Well, there is an answer for that. The church was God's organization that he started with people, and they're there to assist you, not take over that from you. They're to assist, but they're not the main teaching source. It's time for us to reclaim the God-given responsibility for discipleship in our own homes. If somebody came into your house today and they told you that you need to do everything in your house like they do at theirs, would anybody be a little upset about that? I mean, they come in. And they say, all right, we don't like the way that the walls look. So they rip everything off your walls. They paint it so it looks just like theirs. They hang up the same artwork. They go to your your china cabinet. They take all the china out that you have. They put plastic stuff in or paper, whatever it may be. They make everything in that house just like yours. You're going to be a little bit upset. Why? Because it's your home. Can I say this? Very carefully, it's your home that you're responsible for your teaching, your training of your children. And you'll answer to God for that. Don't let somebody else do your job for you. You do it. God's given you the task. And I want to go back to the context of the verse. Look at the verse. And you fathers, ladies, you can take a break for just a moment and just kind of step aside. 
because it's the men. The Bible says, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath. Guys, the weight of training our children to walk and live and know and love the Lord falls squarely on our shoulders, not the wives. Because we're the leaders in the home. God ordained. Someday when we get to heaven, the wife's going to go like that with you. You can give an answer for our children. Why? Because it wasn't her responsibility to do that. It was yours. I'm thankful for wives. I'm thankful for the way so that my wife helps me in raising our children to know and to love the Lord. But you know what? It's not all on her. I'm to be involved in that. Fathers, in a world where fathers are absent, spiritual fathers need to be there. You know, it doesn't take a lot for us to be involved in the lives of our children. They need to see us pray. They need to see us read scripture. They need to see us serve in church. And that list could go on and on and on. But your children need you to teach them what you know from God's word. Mom's already doing it, more than likely. Your kids go on to live for the Lord and it's kind of like a plane flying off an aircraft carrier. Anybody ever seen that? Okay, when a plane takes off from an aircraft carrier, several things have to happen. And if you use this example with raising children, it really makes sense. You point an aircraft carrier into the wind, whatever it may be, whatever direction that is, you point it in the wind. You take that plane and you make sure that plane is facing into the wind. They take that line, they catapult that plane down the deck, hoping that it'll take off. Planes do what planes do because they're aerodynamic and they're designed to do that. The moment that it hits the end of that aircraft carrier, it does one of two things. It either goes up or it goes down really quick. But you know what? When that plane leaves that aircraft carrier, the only person that can control it is the pilot behind that seat. Think about your children for just a moment like that. When you raise a child in a Christian home, you've got to make sure that they're pointed in the right direction. You point them back to the Word of God. You teach them what you know about God. You do everything you can to keep that child focused on Him. And eventually there, there comes that point in time where you've got to give that child a thrust to, to get them going. And, and you do that by living an example before them. And then that time comes when they graduate and they go off into the world and they leave your home. You pray and you hope that the Holy Spirit of God is at work in their life. But can I say this carefully? Just like the pilot in the aircraft, your child is in the driver's seat of their walk with God. You can put up the lights on the dash, you can remind them they're headed for danger, but ultimately they're at the controls. Maybe you're saying this morning, how do I do a better job of bringing my children up in the training and admonition of the Lord? Very quickly, get your priorities straight. You're reproducing who you are in your children. So if your child's faith looked like yours, would that be a good or a bad thing? Be committed to your ongoing discipleship. We want our children to grow. We want them to learn. We want them to develop. What about us? We ought to be doing that. We ought to be learning about Jesus, teaching it to them, using our time intentionally. We all say this, I don't have time. I don't have time. We don't have time. Can I say this? You make time for what's important. And if your children are important to you, you can make time. It doesn't take much time to pray and to read scripture with your children. But we make time for a lot of other things. Don't waste opportunities. Every day is full of life's opportunities to disciple your children. Good times, bad times, stress, hardships, loss, morning, night, meal times, trips, Never stop looking for ways and places and things you can use to disciple your children. 
But above all, parents, you've got to let Jesus reign in your home. We need to be done this morning. Parents, can I ask you, how is your relationship with your children? Child, how is your relationship with your parents? Parents, maybe today it's just simply this. We need to renew our commitment today before God to in all things point our children to Jesus Christ to help them stay focused on eternity. It's hard enough for us to do that, but maybe we need to intentionally say, you know what, I'm going to make a point today. I'm going to make a decision today with my children to do that. May God help us to bring their, our children up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And might we as children who have parents that God has given to us, perhaps they're still alive, might we do our part to honor them. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. Father, I'm thankful for the privilege to preach this morning. Father, help us in raising our children, that we would raise them in such a way that they would go on to live, to love, and to serve you. Parenting is is such a difficult task in the world that we live in. There's so many demands in our lives. Might we make sure that our priorities and our focus do not get skewed in the midst of all of those? Father, be with the parents that are here that have children that are in the back for Children's Church. Father, might, might each of them today make a point, as we've looked at this from the Word of God, to make sure that they're, they're disciplining those children, that they're, they're discipling those children, that they're seeking to do everything that they can, that when those children launch someday into the world, and they're on their own, and they're in the driver's seat, that they're ready to go on and live their life for you and teach others how to do the same. Father, might you keep all of us focused upon eternity because life is short. We know not the hour when our life may be over and we only have so much time with our children to invest in them and eternity is forever. Father, thank you for the privilege we've had to study your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. If it was a blessing, would you consider liking it and subscribing to our channel? And don't forget to hit that bell icon. Thanks for watching.